evening. Good. Yes. Well, okay, let's try that again. Good evening. Thank you. Um, you. You're such an obedient audience. I really appreciate that. Uh, the lights went down. Everybody got really quiet. Well, good evening. Welcome back. Uh, welcome again to our third learning innovation conversation. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Young Moo Kim. I'm director of the Excite Center here at Drexel. I am thrilled to have all of you here with us, here in person, and also many online via YouTube, uh, to hear from tonight's distinguished guest, Leah Beakley. Shortly, she'll be sharing her thoughts on innovative approaches to making and learning and breaking down the barriers to creativity within communities who need it most. Now, Drexel University has always pursued forward-thinking approaches to experiential and hands-on learning, and the Excite Center, in particular, since its founding in 2013, has pursued transdisciplinary collaboration to foster such innovative thinking and practices. Now, why? Why transdisciplinary collaboration? Because we believe that a diversity of perspectives enables more thoughtful development of new ideas and achieves better solutions and outcomes. Now, tonight's event is part of our Learning Innovation Program. And first, I'd like to give you a quick update on how the initiative is developing. Learning Innovation was created to convene a conversation around novel approaches to learning, to spur experiments, exploring new ways to advance learning, and three, to build a community where we can share information and learn from one another. We're hopeful that each time we host such a conversation, we add to our collective wisdom and form connections that resonate across the regional education, technology, innovation, and maker communities. So just a quick question. I can barely see anybody out there. But how many of you have joined us for one of our previous learning innovation conversations? OK, I think I see some hands going up there. But I've got lights right in my eyes. And how many of you went to, have been to both of our previous Learning Innovations Conversation. Okay, I actually see quite a few hands there. Great, we are thrilled to see so many of you return, and we welcome you if you're joining us for the first time. So with each event, we are adding to our knowledge by reflecting upon what we've learned from past speakers, uh, while also looking forward to the, those things that we want to learn next. So what have we learned thus far? We've heard about the importance of mentors especially teachers in our lives, from both John Maida and Mimi Ito. We learned about the importance of supportive social infrastructure or social capital, which can make learners more successful throughout life. We heard about the importance of passion in learning. Mimi Ito talked about connected learning and how one's interests have a profound effect on engagement in learning. We've heard about the importance of cross-training in learning and creating with STEM to STEAM, and how art helps us to see the world differently. And we heard something that echoes our experiences at the Excite Center. Having access to technology and tools is not enough if you don't have the support system of people to help guide how to use those tools. If you missed any of these talks or want to see them again, the full videos and also playlists of video highlights are available on the Learning Innovation section of the Excite website which you see right up there. So if you'd like to, you can always return to those uh, and, and catch the full videos or just watch highlight clips as well. Now, we've also asked, uh, we've had asks of you, our audience and our community. Uh, we've asked for feedback from these events via online surveys, and we've learned quite a bit. We've learned more about you. We know that, for example, that those registered for these events represent a diversity of interests, both in terms of areas of study as well as interest in levels of learning. Um, these are from uh, the registration uh, surveys that many of you kindly filled out in registering for these three events. From email surveys following these events, we know that many of you are engaged with our initiative, that many of you engaged with our initiative are part of, of course, the education community. You see that well represented there, but that also many cross over into other disciplines like technology, research, making, healthcare, environment, and others. We are extraordinarily gratified to see a community with such diverse interests developing around this effort. You can also see that we received more responses to our survey after the second event, and we hope that even more of you will respond to the survey after this event as well. Now, we also asked for some qualitative feedback. And by asking you to describe promising efforts, experiments, and outcomes, 
we also have a better sense of what learning innovation means to you. Now, this word cloud, uh, following the John Maida event, captures the most frequently used terms in your responses to that prompt. And then this is the word cloud generated after, uh, from the responses after Mimi Ito's event. So you see some themes. You see very common themes. You see the, the obviously the most frequently used terms are in larger letters. But this is one way to get a snapshot of how people are thinking about learning innovation. I'll add a few additional insights. The vast majority of respondents from these surveys do state that they have the ability to experiment with and implement creative approaches to learning in their work, but that those who couldn't identified time constraints and internal, silo, internal siloing as the major obstacles to experiment, experimenting and innovation. Those who are able to experiment told us about using new technologies, changing their learning environment, integrating leadership development, and diversifying leadership opportunities among other strategies. And then one other way we're trying to connect the community. Uh, following our last event with Mimi Ito, in partnership with WHYY, we invited you to share stories about your learning heroes. These showcase the many avenues of impact others can have on one's learning. So if you haven't already, I encourage you to check out these stories and Mimi's post-reflection on newsworks.org. Uh, after today's event, we will again ask for you to share your experiences on a slightly different topic, this time focusing on technology as an equalizer or as a magnifier of disparities. Those of you on our mailing list have already received this prompt, but everyone registered tonight will receive a follow-up email about this. Or you can just send your story about technology as an equalizer or a magnifier of disparity to speakeasy at whyy.org. And we thank, in particular, Eric Walter and the Newsworks team, uh, uh, the speakeasy team at WHY, for partnering with us on this effort. So in addition to this opportunity to share your stories publicly, I hope you see that we are incorporating your feedback and your experiences that you send through the private surveys and that these greatly inform our efforts. Once again, we will send a survey after this event uh, via email. You'll also see it on Twitter and Facebook. And we look forward to receiving those responses to help us shape what's next. So what is next? Uh, this spring, we've had three presentations, including this one, exploring aspects of technology and learning innovation. This fall, we will have three more conversations, slightly shifting our focus towards the ecology of learning innovation. That is, how our surroundings, from, from our environment to our learning spaces, to our communities, impact learning. So this summer, we'll have more to tell you about the fall series, but as another step forward, this summer, we'll also begin to share the preliminary results of our national maker survey. This effort is spearheaded by my colleague, Dr. Brian Smith of the School of Education, alongside postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Kareem Edward, and our graduate student, Caitlin Bright. The team has already visited numerous innovative learning and maker spaces across the country. They've examined places in the Pacific Northwest, in the Southwest, some in the Midwest, and of course, in our region as well. So our researchers are already seeing many different approaches and pathways to have an impact as a makerspace in terms of learning. And we aim to synthesize some of these pre preliminary findings uh, after the next round of visits in the upcoming weeks this summer. And of course, to keep up on all of this, uh, to stay updated, please sign up to receive updates at our website, drexel.edu slash excite. And speaking of creative and creative approaches to making, I just want to let you know about one other upcoming event. This is a music technology showcase featuring work by Excite Center students in partnership with musical artist in residence, Peter English. Together, over the course of a year, with support from the Knight Foundation, they've developed technology for novel musical instruments and new compositions, resulting in what we think is a unique interactive performance experience, which will be unveiled on June 17th. For more information, of course, check out the website, excite.ticketleap.com. It will be an experience unlike any other. 
So before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I, I want to give a few, uh, I, I need to express my appreciation to a couple of different organizations. I have to thank the Philadelphia Citizen uh, and Technically, Technically Media, for helping us to reach new communities through their coverage of these events. And of course, we truly appreciate our partners at WHYY, as I mentioned, Eric Walter in particular, for enabling us to continue these conversations online. And finally, I want to thank our lead supporter for this initiative, someone who is dedicated to creating innovative opportunities for learning to benefit all Philadelphians. So please join me in thanking Jessica Berwind and her colleagues who have made this conversation possible. And unfortunately, Jessica couldn't be with us tonight because she's not feeling well, but I hope she is watching online, so I'll give her a wave uh, via YouTube. Now, following the primary presentation tonight, I will start with a few questions, and then we will, of course, invite you to ask questions at the microphones, which are going to be placed on each side of the auditorium. Uh, during, throughout the presentation, please share your thoughts on Twitter. Uh, using hashtag learning innovation. Uh, you can also tweet questions for the question and answer session directly to Excite Center or at sign Excite Center. But if you are either unwilling or unable to tweet, you can even text your questions to this number, 484-588-4158. I will give you a moment to either actually go ahead and send a, a test text if you want right now, so you have that number at the ready. I'll give it to you again after the talk as well, but I'll give you a moment to write that down or to save that. And then, of course, following our presentation, we hope you'll join us for a brief reception afterwards in our lobby. Most importantly, we hope that you will be inspired by the spirit of this program and will want to engage further with us. So please do sign up for updates via our website, drexel.edu slash excite, take our survey, reach out to us and let us know if you're using innovative methods you'd like to share or if anything you've learned tonight in your, uh, if anything you've learned tonight or used in your own practice. We can only be successful if we share what we're learning. So we really do want to hear from you what works and why. So with that, and again, the number is up there, 484-588-4158. Um, with that, uh, let me introduce our distinguished speaker for this evening. She is an extraordinary designer, engineer, educator, and a trailblazer in highlighting opportunities through making, particularly for women of all ages. She is the inventor of the LilyPad Arduino Toolkit, which easily connects electronics with fabrics and clothing for wearable technology projects. She received her bachelor's in physics from Skidmore College, and a PhD in computer science from the University of Colorado at Boulder. At both institutions, she also studied dance, theater, fine art, and design. So you can see her experience transcends normal disciplinary boundaries. She is formerly a professor at the MIT Media Lab, and her research explores intersections and juxtapositions of high and low technologies, new and ancient materials, and masculine and feminine making traditions. Her work has been exhibited internationally in venues, including the Victoria and Albert Museum, the Ars Electronica Festival, and the San Francisco Exploratorium, and has been featured in publications including the New York Times, Boston Globe, Popular Science, and Wired Magazine. Her work has been called playful and whimsical, but also explores how we can create a supportive community around making and creation and increase access and understanding to the underserved. Her work challenges us to question the conventional wisdom about making and invention. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker, Leah Beakley. so much, Young Moo, and thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, let me switch our presentation over here. Yeah, it's really uh, a, a special delight to be here. Um, I've had a wonderful visit to the Excite Center today. 
um, and um, I'm delighted to be here this evening. Um, and I'm in such wonderful company, um, so it's a special honor to be included in the lineup with uh, Mimi Ito and John Maida, what fantastic people. Um, so today I wanted to talk to you about um, kind of issues that I've been grappling with both professionally and personally, um, issues around kind of technology for learning and how that potentially relates to issues of kind of equity in our education system and particularly saying on student interest um, and engagement. So we'll try to uh, make sense of how all of these things uh, relate to each other. So I wanted to start here. Um, so I have uh, a son. He's three. He's awesome. This is us on a backpacking trip uh, last summer. Um, I wouldn't have known this before I had a kid, but it turns out like when you have a three-year-old, that's actually when you start to need to like think about where he's going to go to elementary school, which seems like crazily early, but actually you have to plan that far in advance. Um, and so this year, I've been starting to try to tackle that problem. And like many parents across the country, when I've looked at that landscape, like all the options seem really problematic and kind of crappy to me. Um, and so I wanted to share some of that like frustration with you guys, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you. Um, so New Mexico, like many states, releases like a report card for all of the uh, uh, schools across the state. This is the report card for the school in my district um, where my son would go to school um, if we just like did the default thing. Um, yeah, so slightly alarming. Um, of course, this report card is based um, primarily on standardized test scores. Um, so you can see where that um, data comes from. So at this school, um, where my son would potentially go, only about a third of kids were uh, met expectations, is the terminology they, that they use for um, English and reading um, in third and fifth grade. And the numbers for math are like even way worse. So only like 10% of third graders and 5% of fifth graders like met expectations, like, you know, reach the basic milestones of like competency in math. Um, so I'm not a big proponent of standardized testing and its kind of use um, to like measure student learning or teacher effectiveness or like the quality of a school. But I have to confess that these um, numbers give me pause. Um, and, and for better or for worse, this is essentially the only information that I have about this school. This is the only information about this school that's like made widely available to parents. Um, so this is what I've got to base my decision on. Um, and I'm scared. I'm not sure that this is where I want my son to ha be having his first um, experiences of like formal learning in an educational context. So yeah, that's option number one. Which seems yeah. Um, so I could send my kid to a private school. Um, this is one like seemingly fantastic option in town. So there's a beautiful, um, well-regarded uh, Montessori school. Um, uh, I have toured it. It's great. Um, it lives in this kind of old warehouse building that's like full of like amazing, beautiful light. Um, they have a garden and like chickens that they take care of um, out in the schoolyard. Um, there's an art gallery on the, the ground floor where they display like student art and also art from artists in the community. Everyone there seems just fantastic, engaged, thoughtful. Um, uh, just seems like an all around wonderful place. Um, it costs um, 14K per year. Um, and I mean, this option to me is also not particularly appealing. It's a beautiful school, um, but it's also um, a really isolated, kind of beautiful bastion of privilege. Um, and I'm not sure that that's the experience I want my son to have, like growing up in the world, um, for all sorts of reasons. I, I'm not particularly fond of this option either. Um, like, um, many cities, Albuquerque, where I live, has also a number of um, charter schools um, that are available. Um, this is uh, one example. So there's a Montessori charter school, actually not too far from our house, um, that seems 
lovely. Um, the challenge, of course, with charter schools is that you have to apply to them through a lottery system, and there's like no guarantee that you will get into kind of the school that you're most interested in attending. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty involved involved in whether or not you can attend a charter school. So this seems like a good and potentially viable option, but also very nerve-wracking because it's completely kind of uncertain. So that's the landscape that I'm beginning to confront. Um, and like I say, like none of these options seem especially great to me. Um, of course, I'm not the only person to struggle with such issues. Um, I'm sure, again, many of you have struggled with um, similar themes. Um, the brilliant reporter, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, published uh, a, a really gripping piece in the New York Times Magazine last year about her own personal kind of angst and struggles um, trying to make a decision about where she wanted to send her daughter to school um, in New York City. And the issue that she um, particularly highlighted um, in this article was segregation. Um, so New York City, it turns out, is a profoundly segregated city, both socioeconomically and kind of racially. Um, this is a map of uh, part of New York City, so this is zooming in on Brooklyn. Here you can see lower Manhattan in the upper left-hand corner of the map. And it's color-coded um, by race and ethnicity, so the darker uh, blue a square is um, the larger the percentage of like black and Latino uh, residents um, in that district, um, and the lighter um, lighter a block, um, the higher the percentage of uh, white residents in the district. Um, the schools um, in this map are donated with dots, and so you get a sense. And they're also color-coded color in a similar way. Um, public housing projects in this map are shown in the bright purple. And so you can get a sense of like where different people live and also what the schools um, in the different district look like and to what extent they reflect um, the demographics of a district um, and to what extent maybe they don't. Um, so pretty interesting portrait of like profound um, racial um, segregation that you get in this port in this uh, picture. Also, really interesting dynamics um, around public housing uh, projects, um, and also in these kind of boundaries between like the like white and the like minority neighborhoods, in terms of like what the school schools look like there. Um, Nicole Hannah Jones closed her piece by just reflecting on like the the structure of the education educational system in New York City, which certainly mirrors my experience with like the structure of the public education system in, in my city, which is that like we have a system where these like spectacular um, disparities um, exist. And the existence of these spectacular disparities makes like doing the right thing feel like the hardest thing to do. So when I look at the landscape for my son, I feel like what I want to do from a social justice perspective is like put in direct tension with like what I want to do for like what I think is best for my kid. And I think that's true for a lot of folks, but we don't necessarily have, have to have a system where those things are like in opposition. Like there's no reason that that should be the case, but we've somehow built a system where that feels like it's intention, um, and that's just like so wrong. So of course, there are all sorts of structural problems. So racial um, segregation is one, but of course there are profound disparities in funding and how we fund um, different schools. So this is a map of per student spending, a national map. Um, so the average per student uh, spending in the country is, a, is about $12,000 per student per year. Um, uh, districts that spend significantly more than that are colored dark blue here, and districts that spend significantly less uh, than that are colored red. So you can see that there are large like national disparities in spending, but what in many ways is more striking is that there are large, very geographically local disparities in spending. So 
it was interesting. Um, before I came here, I decided to zoom in on Philadelphia. You guys, I'm sure, know much more about these neighborhoods than I do. But um, uh, the Philadelphia City School Dr District actually spends more than average um, per student per year. So at about $15,000 per, per student uh, in Philly. It's interesting that if you just jump across the border to New Jersey, um, if you look at Camden, they spend about $30,000 per student per year. Um, and then if you go a little bit west, um, the Upper Darby School District spends about uh, $10,000 per student per year. So even in this like very small uh, geographic a uh, area, you get like a three times like difference in spending per kid. Um, yeah, which doesn't, it doesn't seem like that can possibly be like warranted, um, whatever the difference um, in these particular neighborhoods. These disparities persist if we look at um, higher education. So this is a map, uh, this is a, a chart of uh, funding per student um, for colleges and universities um, across the U.S. Again, you see uh, public uh, institutes uh, on the left and private institutions on the right. Um, what I find like particularly um, interesting to do here is to kind of zoom into the middle of that chart where you see um, the amount that we spend per student um, in community colleges contrasted with the amount that we spend per student at uh, private research institutions. So here's your like Drexel and Penn and Harvard and MIT, right? right? Um, and then here's your um, average community college. And basically we spend about five times as much um, on students enrolled at private research institutions than we spend on community college students. Now arguably, like these are the kids who need the most help, the most support, um, the most resources. Um, and those kids on the right, um, they're probably gonna be in a pretty good space. They're probably gonna be pretty productive, engaged members of society, um, which isn't, we shouldn't be spending our resources there, but is to say that like, these kids might not be okay, right? And, and, and that disparity seems especially striking in light of like thinking about the larger social dynamics at work here. Um, Raj Chetty um, at Stanford, uh, along with some colleagues at Brown University and Berkeley and the US Department of Treasury, um, published um, this really interesting study earlier this year that was highlighted in the New York Times that looks at kind of economic um, disparity in higher ed um, from a slightly different perspective. So essentially they looked at your family's um, income and how likely that, uh, how well that could predict like where you would go to school, what kind of college um, you would go to, college or university you would go to or not go to as it, as it were. Um, so you can see that uh, essentially the, the wealthier your family is, the more likely it is that you're gonna go to a really good college a really good university. So we can look at that um, in more particular instances. So here are some stats for Harvard. Um, so 70% of uh, the Harvard student body is drawn from the top 20% uh, of earners in this country. Um, and 3% of the student body is drawn from the lowest 20% uh, of income earners in this country. Um, so, yeah, uh, that is very similar to what is true of almost all of the most elite uh, universities. Um, so this is a chart showing all of the Ivy League colleges in addition to a couple of other universities that they deemed like super elite. So I, it's the Ivy League plus Stanford, MIT, University of Chicago, and Duke. Um, and this shows what their student body populations look like. So um, broadly, um, those colleges uh, get about 15% of their student body from the top 15, uh, top 1% of earners um, in this country. Uh, they get more students from the top 1% of earners than they do from the entire bottom 50%. And if you are, um, if you are a, a truly poor 
student, if you're a student from a truly poor family, um, the wealthy kid, like across town, um, is 77 times more likely to attend an elite um, institution uh, than you are. So, yeah. Um, so maybe, um, maybe there are some people who think that, like, I don't know, the system is fine, that it's okay, that, like, maybe the rich kid is just, like, 77 times, like, smarter than the poor kid, or, like, harder work, 77 times, like, harder working or more capable. Um, so, so maybe, there are, I'm sure that there are people who think that. Um, I don't think that, uh, I guess. I think this is pretty, like, astonishing and crazy. And that it's something we as a society should be working really hard to fix. I think that these inequalities are, are really problematic for all sorts of reasons. And we should know about things like this. And we should be working hard um, to fix them. I'm sorry to say that I do not have the solutions to fixing these problems. I cannot kind of give them to you tonight. Um, but what I wanted to try to do is raise some of these issues with you and then talk a little bit about my own personal experience as a learning researcher and as a developer of kind of technologies for education, reflect a bit on ways that my experience might be somewhat relevant to a, like addressing in, in minor or in modest ways some of these issues. Um, and, and then we'll kind of return to kind of connecting the dots um, towards the end of the talk. So I wanted to shift a bit to kind of shake off that like, um, I don't know, intense like frustration and kind of angst I feel when I see stats like that um, and shift to telling you a little bit more about what I do personally and then again we'll return to connecting the dots towards the end. Um, so I really got engaged in developing kind of learning technologies and working in kind of the learning space and the education space um, as a graduate student. Um, so where I started was uh, trying to connect my interest and passion in kind of textile design and craft on the one hand, which has been kind of a lifelong interest with my interest in electronics and computation, on the other hand. So I, I began to build these projects where those things were like mashed up um, into designs and into uh, installations and so on. So this is just one simple um, example early project that I worked on. So this is a LED display that was stitched into a tank top. And you could program it to display different animated patterns and so on and so forth. You could play little games on it and stuff. Um, so I worked in this space some just as a designer, kind of playing around what, with what was possible. And I found it a really compelling, exciting, interesting space. And my next impulse was that I wanted more people to be having like the creative, expressive, like uh, engineering experiences that I was having. So I thought I should design a toolkit that would allow other people to make this kind of thing. And so actually in 2007, um, the first commercial version of a toolkit, which, uh, which we called Lilypad Arduino, was released. And essentially, it's a set of electronic pieces that you can sew into textiles. And so you connect them with this thread that's electrically uh, conductive, and so you can make electronics that are soft and flexible and washable, um, but have typical kind of interactive capabilities. So there are little sewable, uh, there's a little sewable computer, a battery, um, and sensors like motion sensors and light sensors, temperature sensors, and then things like speakers and motors and LEDs. So you can make all sorts of stuff um, with this kit. Um, here's just uh, a close-up to give you a sense of like how the pieces are connected, with conductive thread. And then once that kit was developed, um, my students and I also worked um, with uh, primarily a, a bunch of different middle and high school students and use this as a medium for introducing them to um, computation and electronics. And we found this to be like a really effective um, and compelling way to do that. So these are two um, middle school uh, girls with showing off like projects that they made in some of the workshops that we taught. So on the left 
is a textile piano, so each of the colorful dots there, um, if you touch it, will play a different uh, musical note. And then on the right is a, a stuffed uh, interactive like monster, we call them, so you can squeeze its ears to get different, get it to play like different music, um, and its eyes can like blink in different patterns. Um, so, <coughs> oh, excuse me. So in addition to, let me go back really quickly. So in addition to working directly um, with students um, on projects, the kit was commercially available. So one of the, the other exciting aspects of the project was to see just what people out in the world, all sorts of different kinds of people, um, were doing with the kit. So I'll show you now just this quick video of different projects that people made with the kit kind of early on in its release. from right to left, each light is a stitch. Knit, yarn over, SSK, knit, 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 knit two together, yarn over. <laughs> I'm going to stop the video there, but that gives you a sense of the different kinds of things that you can make when you combine like electronics and fabric and computation. Um, so it's been really fun and delightful to see all of the different things that people have made. Um, the, uh, another thing that's been fun and delightful and fantastic has been um, seeing other researchers, scholar, scholars and practitioners practitioners kind of adopt the kit um, and take it out into the world in all sorts of creative and fantastic new ways. So actually my dear uh, colleague and friend down the street, Yasmin Kapai here at Penn, um, has been, is working right now on a project kind of using this combination of electronics and textiles in the LA um, public schools to introduce um, high school students to computer science. So they're in the midst of piloting, piloting this program um, that will leverage electronic textiles in that context, which is really exciting and fun to see. So there's all sorts of fantastic, um, interesting stuff um, happening out there. So one of the things that I found most interesting and kind of compelling about this domain when I start, started um, to play in it was this juxtaposition of of a, a typically kind of male-dominated field of electronics and computing with this typically kind of female-dominated field of textiles and fashion. Um, and by like mashing, mashing those things up, um, both kind of the physical mashing and the cultural mashing seemed really interesting and compelling to me. And so after the kit had been kind of out in the world for a few years, um, I decided to try to research if we were having not only kind of helping people make interesting, cool stuff, but if there were, were any cultural kind of impacts for doing that kind of mashup. 
And so um, with my colleague, uh, Mako Hill, who's now at the University of Seattle, um, we conducted a study where we looked at kind of a set of traditional electronics projects. So we went online and just collected a bunch of projects that were built with this more traditional electronics kit, the standard Arduino. Um, and then we went online and collected a bunch of projects that were made with the lily pad Arduino. Um, and I think the visual gives you a sense of some of like the different character of the two um, communities and the two kinds of projects. So the most striking um, outcome of that research um, was visualized here. Um, so we found that in the traditional electronics community, about 2% of projects in general were, were done by women. Um, and in the lily pad Arduino community, um, that stat was kind of turned on its head. And a majority of projects, so about 65% of all the projects were done by women. Um, so that seemed pretty um, striking um, and interesting. So I wanted to share with you what I think is like the larger takeaway from this example of like an educational technology. To me, what the most important lesson from this whole endeavor has been is that technology and by extension set STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, these are disciplines that we tend to think of as like somewhat removed from culture. They're very abstract, right? They're pure. They're like above and beyond like cultural practices or cultural constraints. They're not like fuzzy things like literature or history, right? They're, they're these pure like abstract entities. But that way of thinking about STEM, particularly in the context of learning, um, particularly in the context of education, is just um, wrongheaded, I think. We need to um, acknowledge that STEM is a product of culture. Um, and it's completely situated in culture. And it's completely related to like who does it and kind of what counts um, as STEM like in our, in our communities, like what is celebrated and elevated as, like, as STEM. And I've been especially interested in the fact that there's all sorts of cultural practice, in particular all sorts of making practices and subcultures and communities out there where what they do is like just incredibly rich with STEM content, and yet these, um, many of these subcultures are largely invisible to us as STEM. So they're not celebrated as STEM. We're not going out and saying like, all kids should be doing crochet. I mean, come on, this is a really important thing that all kids need to be engaged in like crocheting summer camps. But, but crochet is like this spectacularly rich way to engage with STEM, with math, with algorithms, with geometry. Um, I'm not gonna make the specific argument for each of these images. Um, I've given other talks where I go kind of more in detail, but I want to just um, plant a seed here um, to get you to think about kind of each of these images as like, a practice, a cultural heritage that is like incredibly rich with STEM. Um, so up on the left, you have Grandmaster Flash, like the grandfather of hip hop, essentially, who hacked together like turntables to kind of develop an entirely new musical instrument. So brilliant engineer. Lowriders, kind of similar story. Uh, yeah, math, non-Euclidean geometry. Uh, I've talked a little bit about crochet. I'll kind of leave it there. But, but again, get back to like the takeaway message that so many cultures, cultural practices, so many different kind of subcultures um, do amazing kind of STEM stuff. And if we can connect to kids' cultures, to their history, um, to their identity, that's a wonderful way to get them interested and engaged. If they feel like, oh, actually, STEM is about me because I am interested in fashion or textiles or design. Like, that's a tremendous way to get someone engaged in school or in STEM or kind of whatever it may be. So it turns out, getting a little bit back to our educational system, turns out like engagement is so, so important. 
um, student, um, yeah, student engagement is predictive of all sorts of things. Um, most notably, kind of what has been studied pretty extensively is how engaged kids are in school um, is really predictive of whether or not they're gonna graduate from school, so whether or not they're gonna finish school. This is a chart of student um, engagement that gives you a sense of like your average kid's experience with school. So kids, when they first go to elementary school, they're super psyched, they're super engaged, um, they love it, and that feeling gradually, sadly, diminishes over time, and they feel less and less um, connected to school and what they're doing there. Um, so there's been a fair amount of study in the education uh, universe of engagement and also of disengagement. In fact, one of the seminal studies of student disengagement took place here in Philadelphia. So Robert Balfance is a researcher who's been studying um, this topic for a really long time. Um, a few years ago, he uh, conducted a very kind of large uh, scale study looking at um, this is about 13,000 students over almost 10 years here in the Philadelphia School District, focusing primarily on high poverty districts and um, districts that had a majority um, minority po student population, which is where, incidentally, kind of disengagement tends to be most rampant. Um, and he found that if you looked at middle school students, in particular, if you looked at sixth graders, just a few warning signs were like super predictive of who would later drop out of school. So a few early kind of signals of disengagement um, were highly predictive of whether or not fit kids would finish school. So kind of most importantly, which is like a really simple one, is like are kids coming to school? Like are kids going to school on a regular consistent basis? And if they're not, they're probably eventually going to drop out. If kids failed a core subject in sixth grade, they probably aren't gonna make it. Uh, if a kid was suspended, even just once in sixth grade, probably not gonna make it, not gonna finish high school. And um, similarly, if they just got a bad behavior mark, if their teachers kind of singled them out as behaving poorly in school, um, like with some like behavioral issue, um, those kids are, are uh, unlikely to actually finally graduate. So, um, so very early on, you can kind of follow the kids who are disengaged from school, and you can know that like those are the kids who are really struggling. An interesting like side fact um, to this is that these kids, it's not like they drop out after sixth grade. The majority of them stay in school another five years before they drop out. So that's like just also very interesting. So the news isn't all bad though. He also studied like what. How do we re-engage kids? So when kids like disengage, when they lose that um, connection to school, how do you redevelop it? How do you reconnect kids to school? And he found like four, um, four things that were crucial to re-engaging students in their kind of educational uh, experience. The first two are social. So um, getting back um, to a lot of the issues that, that Mimi um, talked about in her uh, presentation. So uh, teacher support, so how much a student felt that the, their teacher cared about them, knew them, and cared uh, how they were doing. That was, that was super important. High expectations, so this, the, the, sent, the extent to which a student felt that the school like cared that they did well, expected them to do well, that was important. And then the second two are much more about the actual content of school. So how material was presented and what kind of material was presented. And it was super important that what kids are learning at, at school they felt was like A, useful and relevant, like why should I learn this? Am I ever gonna need to know whatever the, you know, whatever it, it might be. Like does this seem relevant to who I am and relevant to my life? And the second one is like, is this interesting? Is this exciting? Am I curious about this or um, uh, like delighted or surprised by this? So these are like the key things <laughs> that we want to provide um, to our kids. So he took these findings and then created 
um, an intervention that he implemented in certain Philadelphia schools, um, which he calls the Talent Development Middle Grade. Um, that's what TDMG um, stands for. Um, and he found that in the schools that where um, that were really focused on this, like, kind of these social issues of, like, student um, uh, school, like, setting high expectations for kids and teachers, like, really trying to make a personal connection with their students, along with this focused, uh, focus on, like, relevance and, like, interest in the material, that if you did that, um, you got really striking results. So kids, if they went through to a middle school that was, like, really intensely focused on these things, they got um, much higher graduation rates, um, uh, even for these kids that had these kind of bad warning signs initially. So social relationships um, and kind of interesting, engaging curricula. That's what we've got to provide. I want to return to this issue of culture and make an argument that by connecting to kids' culture, in different ways, that that's a fantastic way to provide at least the second half of that equation. So you always need people. You always need that social support and connection. Um, but a fantastic way to provide interest and engagement is through culture and through appreciating that like STEM is a cultural artifact and all of education is a cultural artifact. Um, and I wanted to share with you one more study that I've just been totally obsessed with recently, which is a study that came out last year <coughs> um, from researchers at Stanford. Um, and they, <coughs> they um, conducted a study in the San Francisco uh, school district over um, about five years involving about 1,500 students in um, multiple schools ac across the San Francisco uh, school district. And they also involved um, students that were um, at risk of dropping out or kind of failing high school. So these, uh, they identified students in eighth grade who were right on like the C, like right on the passing line um, in their GPA. And they assigned like the poorest um, achieving uh, students to a special social, social studies class. Um, so in, in place of their regular social studies class, they would take this ethnic studies class. And the purpose of that class was to connect the kids' culture, their kind of cultural identity, who they were, to what was happening at school. And so you see this blurb here. Um, so the focus on kind of themes of social justice and discrimination and encourage students to explore their own individual identity, their family histi history, their community, so on and so forth. Um, they found that by contrasting the kids who participated in the program with those that did not, again, like pretty astoundingly impressive outcomes. Um, so the students who participated in this fairly modest intervention, um, their attendance like shot way up. Um, so we know from the previous studies that like attendance, like just getting the kids to come to school, super important. Um, their GPA went up on average by like one and a half points, like crazy, um, and credits that they earned, like the actual, the number of classes that they took and um, successfully kind of passed also went way up. So just more evidence that connecting kind of kids' identity, in particular like their culture, um, to learning, to education, to school, um, is a really powerful way to begin to tackle um, some of the inequalities that pervade our system. Okay, so stepping back, I want to come back uh, for a minute um, to technology. So what does this have to do with educational technology? Um, I want to offer you um, kind of a theory and like encouragement to proceed in a particular direction. Um, so a typical way that we approach um, technology, kind of learning technologies, as we do a really cool, innovative new thing that we're excited about and is, is awesome. And then as an afterthought, we kind of address issues of maybe diversity and equity. So we might like do this really cool thing and then, okay, we'll teach a summer workshop for like girls or for like 
minority students or something, and we'll, we'll kind of engage them in this sideways, like afterthoughty way. Um, and what I want to propose to you is instead to kind of to look at the world through the lens of like subcultures that are currently kind of um, invisible to like the mainstream culture and to propose that these are like spectacularly ripe and fascinating and amazing like opportunities for technology development. So if we look at these communities where what they do is already kind of so rich with, um, with in these cases, like STEM content, that these are like, to my mind, low hanging fruit for like technological innovation. Um, and I would encourage you all to kind of think about things in that way and have that lens be kind of the foundation of technological innovation as opposed to kind of an afterthought add-on thing. And I just think that's just a really powerful kind of underutilized way to approach design for this entire space. And like kids are interested in all sorts of different kinds of things, different cultures, different communities do really different, but really rich, vibrant, like fascinating things. And I guess I see a world where all of these different, like fantastic, marvelous subcultures um, can provide their own entry points, like into um, the universe of learning technology and into ultimately kind of the educational system. And that provide, by providing lots of different kind of on-ramps, lots of different points of access, that that is the way that we should be tackling how we connect with different kinds of communities, different kinds of people. I also want to say that I don't think that technological innovation or kind of taking this approach that I propose is like going to solve all our problems. I think that in parallel with creatively developing interesting new technologies and kind of um, creatively developing new curricula and so on and so forth, we have to be engaged as citizens. Um, we have to be engaged as voters, as parents, as like school board members, and so on and so forth, and then advocating for and working for like structural change um, as citizens as much as we um, kind of work um, as designers, as innovators, as business leaders. Um, so yeah, I wanted to kind of conclude with just this thought that has really stuck with me. Um, uh, I've been mulling this over a lot recently. Um, so this is a quote from a great like civil rights like hero of, of our age, um, Brian Stevenson. Um, and he just asks us to think about like the way that we rectify poverty is not to like give people money or is not to like think of things in those terms, but is to create like a just system. So thank you very much. Thank you, Leah, for those uh, amazing remarks. We're going to uh, turn to take some questions, if you'd like to take a seat. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I'm going to change this back so that oh, yeah, yeah. people can see where they can send their questions to. Um, bear with me just half a second here. OK. So yes, you can send questions via Twitter to Attic Site Center. Um, or you can text questions to the number that's up there. Now, I, I didn't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm sorry. It is a one-way text number. It's receive only. We can't send, <laughs> send answers back to you. I apologize for that. Uh, but yes, you can send your questions there. Uh, and, and I see some piling up already. So thank you, everyone. So um, again, thank you for your presentation. Really, really uh, thought-provoking and inspiring. Um, let me start with a, a, something that certainly always drives me. I mean, you know, as parents of young children, right, who are going through this process. And again, I mean, 
every I, I believe every, every child is different, and you know, and we see that I think through you know through their activities and their passions. But this sort of you know the the active making, the active act of creation. Um, you know, what advice would you have for other parents of young children to to kind of get involved with that kind of activity, find an outlet for that activity? Do you have any kind of general thoughts on that? Yeah, to get kids engaged in making. I mean, so one thought is to like follow your kid and like what they're interested in. I mean, so I, my son is three um, and he already um, like builds and, and makes. And, and part of that for me is just being attuned to when and how that is happening and like trying to support it. So that's one piece of advice just to be kind of like, um, kind of try to have your antenna up for what your kid is already doing and to support and like um, uh, encourage that. The other thing that I would say is, I guess I do believe that there's something especially kind of marvelous, especially for young kids, about really working with your whole body and working with your mind. And so kind of uh, supporting activities that have that element of kind of engagement of like your, the hands and the brain, uh, I think is really um, fantastic. And there's so many ways to do that. I mean, right now my son's favorite thing is like the sandbox and like a bucket and like a spoon and like, it's great. Um, uh, as as um, as kids get older, that's probably not sufficient. Um, <laughs> but there are so many I resources, <laughs> like local science centers um, uh, are fantastic uh, resources. There are so many things online. Instructables is a great resource. It, um, uh, yeah, so uh, that's just a few, but there's so many fantastic entry points, I think. Yeah, but as you alluded to in your presentation, there is, you know, at, at least with sort of the, the more traditional forms of making uh, a sort of a gender bias in the tools that are available, or may, maybe some of the pathways that are available. And um, so I guess, you know, uh, actually somebody wanted to ask, I mean, you know, uh, how did, was that what motivated you to develop the li lily pad? Was that, was that that, or, or you can tell us maybe a little bit of the origin story of the lily pad. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I guess I spoke a little bit um, about that in the presentation. Uh, I've, I've been interested for a while, I think before the lily pad um, development in just um, kind of how different kind of, like where different kinds of making takes place in our culture. And just as, um, as a kid and as an adult, like I always did kind of textile related making as like a side, like passion thing. I was just really interested in that. I knit and crocheted and made my own clothes and did all of those things. Uh, and it felt like on the one hand that it was this highly gendered set of activities. And on the other hand, like the reason that it was highly gendered and, you know, had complex relationship to like the status of like women's work and anyway, we don't have to go there. but but it's not because that work wasn't intellectually challenging and engaging and worthwhile and important. It was because of these weird kind of patterns of like what gets appreciated and seen and what doesn't. And anyway, so, so that was definitely part of what undergirded my development of the lily pad. It's just a, a kind of subversive sense of like that kind of mixing up these traditions would be interesting. Um, and you showed, of course, the you know in your survey of those projects, kind of the uh, the differences in engagement. Uh, but somebody uh, actually, actually wanted to ask a question: How do boys respond to using the lily pad? Yeah, so that there's been interesting. Um, uh, um, there's been some interesting outcomes along those lines. Also, I think in the um, in the best. So I'll start by saying, I guess. There's a potential danger, I think, that people are, are on high alert to, which is there's some sense that by creating the lily pad, there's this implication, okay, now there's, that's what girls should do, and this is like what boys should do. And so that is, we definitely want to avoid that. There's no implication that like, because this is, exists, girls shouldn't do robotics, they should do this instead, or like, you know, boys shouldn't do this or whatever. I, I want to make that explicit because I think you can get into problematic kind of dynamics if, if that's the assumption of the operating um, 
uh, undergirding thing. But what you see in mixed groups when they work with e-textiles, you see some really interesting dynamics. Um, there's been some research, um, uh, Kylie Pepler and Yasmin Kafai have done, which showed that um, in teams that worked on e-textile e projects, like boys were likely to take on different roles in the team project than they would take on, like if they did, for example, a robotics um, project. They were more likely to play kind of a supporting role and less likely to play a leading role. So you saw all sorts of, um, but they also engaged kind of with interest and engagement and, and kind of passion. So, so all sorts of like interesting um, dynamics that work there. So certainly I want to invite people, I'm getting a ton of questions here, which is great. You guys are really with the texting, good for you. Um, but I, if you do want to ask a question at one of the microphones, I do want to invite you also to make your way to a microphone, and we will take actual live, in real life questions as well. But uh, let me turn to, to, turn to the, the texts here. Um, let's see, here's an interesting question. Um, which frames it this way, that, that sometimes discouragement towards students from teachers, uh, you know, or, or sometimes that discouragement might come from teachers, right? Teachers sure. think of students have to fit a certain mold, a certain box, and you know, the labeling sure. that happens that you pointed to. Um, so what are your thoughts on how technology can be used, might be used to mitigate that, to circumvent that, or maybe, you know, fi find another way? Yeah, I mean, um I mean, part of, part of addressing that is my hope to get as many people as I can to like see STEM in like a broader context and to see it, to see STEM and, and kind of educational opportunities more broadly in, the, in this broad context and to see it in spaces where maybe our kind of knee-jerk assumption is that it may not be present. Um, so, so anyway, that I feel like there's just advocating for like, being super sensitive to what might be the value of like every possible thing that kids are doing um, is one way. Um, and I do think there are opportunities also for kind of tools that kind of help people be aware of patterns in their own behavior and in student behavior that, that might escape them otherwise. Um, so one simple example that was kind of recommended by some of the engagement researchers that I talked about was just like um, uh, ways to, to like highlight like student attendance, like so that teachers are hyper aware of like, hey, this kid is like not coming to school and you should like act in a positive way to like get them to come to school more than they do. And that, that students are kind of, uh, that teachers can be semi aware of those things, but maybe, um, that tools for, for simple things like that can actually be very helpful. Great. I see we have a question from the microphone. Hello, so. I will be brave. Yes. <laughs> so you. often when we talk about education, we're talking about it in the context of students and children. But adults need education too, and I was wondering if you had any remarks on how to engage and educate adults who may not have the opportunities that students have in the classroom. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's such a... Very it, simple it, question. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, it's an important question. I think particularly um, my mom um, is, w teaches at a community college and I have a cousin actually who in, much later in life um, went through and got his associate's degree recently at a community college. And I think, I mean, um, community colleges are like amazingly wonderful places, <laughs> number one. It, in terms of adult education, I've been like astounded to just see what a um, like transformational role that they can play in people's lives, particularly adults who, you know, for a variety of reasons, like maybe missed out on those opportunities earlier in their life. Um, so engaging with like community colleges is awesome. Um, there, I mean, adults also face like all sorts of other challenges that are likely to be working and have kids at school. And so, I mean, I think, I'm not sure that I have particular insight about tackling those problems beyond kind of the obvious of like supporting, kind of um, supporting people who have like a full life who can, ha can't just go to school um, and supporting that in lots of different and creative ways I think is important for adults kind of connecting with with college. Thank you. 
Thanks. Do we have a question over there as well? Hey, um, you talked about connecting to the culture and the interests of students, mm -hmm. not just the theory of STEM. So in a public school when there's so much diversity of different interests, how do you practically cater to everyone's interests? Yeah, yeah, gr such a, a good question. Um, so a couple of things. I mean, one is uh, allowing, so within the context of school, um, making space for students to like direct um, some of their own learning. So for example, that might be as simple as um, open-ended projects where students get to decide like what their project is about and kind of actively encouraging students to be involved not only as kind of listeners and consumers of like what the teacher is sharing but to be actively involved in like crafting like the focus of particular lessons or kind of particular topics. So I think there's actually quite a lot of room um, for like, I'm not entirely comfortable with all of these words, but like personalization um, in school, like there's more, there's room that we're not currently taking advantage of in a widespread way. Um, so, so anyway, allowing students to kind of play a more active role in just, you know, what they're doing and what they're learning is I think of just an important like grounding philosophy that needs to be there. See, another kind of a, a question that ties into that. Um, well, you've highlighted some of the enormous disparities that there are in terms of resourcing, I mean, throughout the country in any particular region, uh, but then kind of point to, you know, a compelling use sometimes of technology as an authentic way of engagement. Are, what are your thoughts on how we can support more equitable access, especially when it involves cost, let's say, investing in technologies, um, which have come down significantly but still may not be scalable? across the entire school or school district? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, so one high level comment is I think that, again, like as citizens, we should all be kind of aware of some of these disparities and like I would advocate for like being advocates in our community for allocating resource, resources like broadly across public education in a more equitable way. So that's like, that's like, that's one way to tackle this issue. Kind of getting, um, getting to like the nuts and bolts of like, how do we get often like expensive cutting edge, you know, technologies into like low resource institutions. Um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge that's come up um, in my own like relationships with, with educators in many instances. I think as developers of technology, um, kind of providing alternative, like lower cost pathways to similar experiences is a really kind of powerful and useful thing to do. Um, that's not always possible, but often it is. Um, uh, it, so I'll, I, I don't have a great like magical solution to like how you get expensive things to like poor people, um, <laughs> but, but that's maybe at least a start. I mean, I just made it add a comment. I mean, certainly through our experience, sometimes it's just, I mean, the costs are always coming down, right? Yeah. I mean, what you can get from, you know, uh, SparkFun <laughs> now, yeah. I mean, a, a lily pad, the cost has certainly come down, yeah. an Arduino. Uh, and, and so if you, you know, for those we work with, we often just, you know, keep aware yeah. of these things. What used to be a cost prohibitive project last year is not yeah, a cost yeah. prohibitive project this year in a lot of our outreach activities. So, and I think that just, uh, you know, having partners who are, you know, engaged with that and, and understand where the technology is going, right? Yeah, that's that, that, that's one wonderful of the wonderful point. things about computing technology is yeah. that, you know, what you can get, uh, what, what was great last year comes down in price every single year. Yeah. And so, and, and even though you, you know, that, that uh, you, you can leverage those, those, um, those savings, I think, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. future. Uh, let's see, we have another person at the microphone. Hey, what's up? Another uh, brave soul. Thank you. Uh, my name's John. Myself. I really like the presentation, and it brings up something I'm working with right now. Uh, PHL Droplet, we are working to track lead concentration levels in Philadelphia households, and especially uh, schools. So many low-income 
schoolings have lead piping. So I'm, we're, we're using technology, GIS, you know, stuff to show people that it's very real. Over 12% of Philadelphia's households have lead piping. So in a sense, how would you th use technology to not just inform people, but to change the landscape of such obvious, you know, economic discrepancies and economic differences? Yeah, yeah, it's it's such a um, it's such a terrible like issue and um, totally you know, yeah fixable. yeah it I mean and it's it's um, I, yeah I mean even just small le like levels of lead for kids is linked to like very bad like educational Completely. outcomes yeah. um, so it's such a huge issue um, I think. I would say the first step, um, which is, in, it feels like it's kind of, you know, I, we can't be glad about this, but it's improved since Flint is just being aware of the, this issue um, and it's like prevalence across the US, like, like so much, uh, so many communities like struggle with lead issues, uh, even um, increasingly like affluent communities in, in former industrial area, the areas is not necessarily limited to poor kids, although it's like way more likely to exist in those communities and not be addressed. Yeah, it's treated. usually a denser. But, so I think the first step is awareness and just kind of using as many kind of pathways as possible to increase awareness that this is like a huge issue and maybe it's one that we thought we solved but we didn't. Um, I think I would love to see um, more like access to kind of technologies around testing and ways of like advocate, uh, aggregating and visualizing those results. There's been some great work on that front, namely kind of journalists have done some of that work. So like Vox.com did some kind of wonderful data visualizations around lead and like how likely your like district is, is to be like have a lead problem and stuff. So I think that, um, work just like data collection and data visualization is an area where technology can really help. Um, um, so those are a couple of thoughts, uh, but it, it's such a kind of heartbreaking, like crazy issue that we're still grappling with that, yeah. Well, I mean, in Philly, it's completely like, it's not the water supply necessarily, it's just antiquated piping. So it's really yeah. simple. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. also because, uh, Tenants are the ones deciding this, so government involvement. But uh, yeah. well, to let me add a comment on top of that. I think another thing we can do is get students, get get you know K twelve students engaged in this process. Sure. And we have projects actually run out of here through our GK twelve program, looking at water quality, where our where our students, our grad students, have partnered with mm -hmm. teachers, and of course have done water testing and built water filters with high school students and sometimes yeah. middle school students. Again, that doesn't solve the problem, but at least it raises awareness. And, and then those students and those families and those teachers can start advocating uh, more, more vociferously you know, for, for changing those situations. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, uh, let's see. Oh, we're, we're running short on time, so I'm gonna get through a couple ones quickly here. Um, let's see, where do you, are your interests gonna take you in the future? And might there might you be redesigning a new lily pad? That's a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, gosh, there's so many things to be interested in. Um, uh, one area of interest is kind of in the craft, like design, art, technology space, um, is expanding into kind of mechanical elements um, for potentially for textiles, but also for work with paper. So I've done a lot of work in paper craft and um, kind of putting, embedding electronics in paper. So one particular area of interest is just kind of beginning to work with mechanical components and mechanical structures. Um, so that's one area of interest. I also am very interested in the broad area of computational design and, and that as like a powerful kind of learning pathway for um, a different kind of subculture and community of students. Um, I think there's lots of potential there to kind of think about that as a powerful educational medium. So those are a couple of interests. Right. Another question here? The mic. Hi. Hi, thank you for uh, the presentation. It was really enlightening. Uh, I work with students in uh, academic makerspace a lot, and there's a lot of uh, 
great informal learning that happens in maker spaces, I'm sure you're aware. I just want to, I'm curious what your thoughts are on, on integrating the informal learning and all the benefits of that that happens in maker spaces into a formal learning environment. Yeah, I mean, you, um, it's such an important and interesting topic. I think there's great work being done um, in that um, space. Um, in particular, again, I'll cite um, Kylie Pepler, who has been working with other um, researchers kind of in collaboration with the Maker Education Initiative and, and around this issue of like, how do we assess like making um, in ways that are like kind of preserves, I think the, what is most important about making kind of preserves like some autonomy of the student, um, but also will provide like uh, an assessment that feels um, meaningful to, to like educational institutions. So I think really good research is underway that's trying to tackle that problem that I would, I would like point you towards towards that, but there, I think there's an increasing, um, an increasing acceptance of like portfolios as like a valid part of assessment. Um, and you're seeing that, so one of this really encouraging result along those lines has been like there's a computer science AP exam where now a portfolio submission is actually part of the AP exam. So I think in that like super mega structured environment, if they are now able to kind of grapple with like portfolios as part of assessment that that's like a really good sign. So so I think things are heading in a in a positive direction on that front. But there's still a long way to go. Um, okay, since you're at the mic, go ahead. We'll take one more from the mic. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, my daughter has a chronic medical condition and um, that has pushed her into an online education environment mm. because she's not able to actually be in school. Right, right. Um, I think for her, the maker environment would be a great concept, mm. but again, she can't go to a, a one of the, the right, schools that right. has that maker concept to it. Is there any way of her engaging in that through an online community? Yes, I think definitely. Um, so. Um, I mean, there are many sites, um, kind of websites and communities where you can find truly terrific um, um, kind of projects and also communities of people who are really excited about the projects. Um, so Instructables comes to mind, also Ravelry, which is like a site particularly for kind of textile craft and particular like knitting and crochet. Um, uh, so there are, I think, many really rich kind of informal environments that she, that, that people can connect to, and I think those can be really um, fantastic. To the best of my knowledge, I don't, and, and I could be, the, there may exist something like this that I'm unaware of, but I don't know of any, like, any um, kind of online, spaces where they're structured in terms of like formal education so you can kind of have both the formal educational experience and the making experience. I think that's a gap that could be filled. Um, there are, I mean, that you could cobble something together also using kind of MOOCs that are, or particularly have some hands-on content. Um, but that's an interesting kind of gap in that space that, um, that that could be filled in all sorts of creative ways. The, the one other thing I'll mention is that I do know of um, kind of several people who have put together like mobile kind of maker labs to take into like into hospitals or to, to people who are kind of stuck at home for various reasons. So those are some projects that you might look into. It may be that she could have someone actually come to your home like, you know, once a week or something and, and help facilitate activities like that with her. Um, so that's another resource. Okay, thank you. Great. Sorry, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay, last one from the mic and then we're going to wrap up. So awesome. go ahead. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I definitely get the thing with kids because I work with kids a lot. Um, but I actually had a question um, about kids too because you were showing the map of New York and I'm from there, so I totally I know those neighborhoods. Um, 
And so one of the things that I, I do know coming from places like that is um, when you're talking about futuristic technology, whether it's e-textiles or robotics or coding and things like that, um, it mostly comes down to relevance. What is the relevance for right. my life? And right. why would I be interested, whether or not there's a maker space available? Right. And so I wanted to know if you had, um, or if you were aware of any people who are working um, with e-textiles um, specifically to advocate for you know, social justice or like anything like that because what I don't see is that mostly. Because um, I also sure. work with high fashion and I'm not seeing e-textiles being worked into that way. So I just see a lot of missed opportunities, especially mm -hmm. in terms of allowing these um, groups or people to use this technology in a way that actually creates more well-being in their lives. Sure, sure. Um, on this front, I would point you to the work of like some awesome kind of institutions and colleagues. So um, in particular, like Nicole Pinkard, who I think was in Philadelphia recently, has been doing awesome work um, in Chicago. Um, and, um, and one of their programs has revolved around like e-textiles, e um, so the Digital Divas program. And she's um, done some, I think, really deep thinking about some of these issues and some really strong work on that front. Um, also, we worked from, we, I've worked some, and my, my students have worked some with this fantastic organization in the Bronx. Um, and I am like gonna have a, a brain like frazz and not be able to recollect the full name of their, um, their institution, but it's this beautiful, awesome space in the Bronx. And they also, um, and I'll, I'll get the name to you later no after, um, if it pops up into my brain. Um, but they do essentially kind of arts and like um, arts education in the Bronx. So their focus is in art and kind of situating that within the communities that they're part of there. Um, and we've, we worked some with them and they've worked with other kind of technology and art related um, kind of folks. And again, like I think the work that they are doing is really fantastic. Um, I mean, I don't mean this to like skirt your question because I no, think it's totally. super important, but the one thing I would say is like I found um, is that like the people embedded in these, in a particular community are like the people that need to, that can Absolutely. best answer those questions. Absolutely, and so like yeah. the best way I've found to address those relevance issues are like by partnering with people embedded totally. in the communities that they're part of. And like, and, and those kinds of partnerships, I should say, also I think are like so critical to any work that gets done in these kind of spaces, so. Absolutely, and that's what I was asking about was partnerships or any work of any kind. But thank you, I appreciate it so much. Thank you for your questions. Okay, we conclude each of these learning innovation conversations with a very special moment we call the lightning round. All right. <laughs> and I have a lot of questions queued up here. So, um, you know, we can put like whatever 90 seconds on the clock or the virtual clock here. If you want to try to sneak in a question, please be my guest. So we're going to start the lightning round now. So how do you compare making physically versus virtual making in an online world? Yeah, I think <laughs> they have certain things in common and certain things obviously not in common. So um, I think ideally they have in common like um, that the, the project is like guided by a person's like excitement and interest. Um, it's constructive, it's creative. Um, I think what they have apart is that the physical world does have this connection to your body that isn't entirely absent from the virtual world but is um, diminished, I would say, in the virtual world. And I guess I'm someone who, who I do think like the body is important. Um, it's not better but it's just important to have at least some experiences that engage our body as well as our mind. So. Okay. What's something that most educators get wrong about making? Yeah, divorcing it from culture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. If you cast these other projects, let's say Grandmaster Flash and the others, uh, as STEM, how do you avoid accidentally devaluating the other aspects of their activity? If everything is seen as STEM. Yeah, sure. I think that's a much larger problem of like 
um, I have a, a, a colleague, Erica Halverson, who has uh, this phrase that I borrow that's the STEM monster, which is that, like, I think the focus on STEM in education is just problematic, full stop. Um, so, yeah, it's problematic in that context. It's just problematic. Um, so we shouldn't be elevating STEM over other disciplines, period. Uh, yeah. How do we make space for making when you don't have space? Yeah, that's a tricky <laughs> one. I, um, you need space. I, it can be a tiny amount of space. I mean, even like a desk, but you need space. Uh, is your artisanal technologies idea still an active interest of yours? That uh, could be yes or no. Yes, I would say. <laughs> let's see. Uh, let's see. What are steps? Some. What's one stepping stone that helped you launch into this particular career that may not be obvious? I think growing up like a rural, like hippie kid in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> okay. How do we get more women and underrepresented minorities into STEM? Um, again, like uh, focusing on the kind of cultural practices of different groups and like celebrating and seeing them. Great. Uh, what was your favorite project from your research group at MIT, the high tech, high low tech group? Oh, I can't choose a favorite. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll cite a couple of just delights. Um, I loved my student Gigi's pop-up book. I loved uh, David Mellis's like uh, DIY cell phone, which by the way, he still uses every day. Um, and I loved um, Hannah Per Wilson's um, textile sensors. Okay. Uh, just a couple more. What's been the most difficult experience you've had in your work, in pursuing your work? difficult um I feel like I've, I've been so fortunate it's it's hard to say I guess I would say I am I've been um, most kind of baffled and frustrated by the fact that like not everybody cares about these issues of equity and diversity in the way that I do and I don't understand why and I I, I, w I wish I could understand that better yeah I wish everybody cared <laughs> uh, let's see do you in the schools that you're considering for your child do you have a choice yet or are you still exploring those options? No, I do not. I do not know. Okay, here's an easy one. Where is the future of e-textiles going? Yeah, <laughs> um, it's interesting. I, I've been really, um, uh, I've been pessimistic for a while, but the Jacquard project at Google has made me more optimistic. There are so many challenges you have to overcome to actually getting like manufactured stuff out in the world, but they seem to be um, tackling some of those challenges. So. Right. All right, last question. Do you have a learning hero? And if so, who? Someone who's greatly yeah. influenced you in terms of learning. I have to cite two. Let's see. Um, my grandmother, I think I'll just talk about my grandma because she's so awesome. Um, she's had, she's like the most joyful, engaged, like marvelous person to interact with. And she's had like the craziest, most challenging, difficult life in the world. And it's like amazing that like those things are so different and yet she's like delightful, happy, like engaged, marvelous person. So. Please join me in thanking Leah Beakley. <laughs> so we do have a reception uh, just outside. Please join us for some refreshment. Please don't forget to sign up to, uh, for email updates about our maker survey and uh, send your stories to speakeasy at whyy.org. We will see you at the next Learning Innovation Conversation this fall. Thank you. <laughs>